Hi everyone, welcome to uh, another Sports Psych show. I am really excited today and slightly out of my comfort zone. I have leading athletic development trainer Vern Gambetta um, on the show today. Briefly introducing Vern, um, he is currently the director of Gambetta Sports Training Systems. And uh, Vern's CV is, well, we can actually do a whole show uh, based on Vern's CV. It's absolutely ginormous, um, hence why I'm so excited to have him on the show. Um, he's been the director of conditioning for Chicago White Sox, director of athletic development for New York Mets in football, and for everybody in England, that's American football. Um, he has been consultant to San Francisco 49ers, Kansas City Chiefs, in hockey, he's worked with San Jose Sharks. He's worked hugely in tennis, uh, softball with the American women's softball bronze medalists. Um, and oh, in Australian st- softball. Sorry, <laughs> Aust- Australian. I was, yes, I, I knew I'd go wrong somewhere. And, uh, f- and he's also been a conditioning coach for several major league soccer teams. Uh, for the for the U.S. Men's World Cup soccer team as well. You've already corrected me, Vern, but have I by and large got things right there? Oh, yes, by all means. I mean, it, it's, uh, I guess, uh, having a CV like that just reflects a dirt, certain amount of longevity. This is my 50th year uh, of coaching, and uh, I, I think the, 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 the part that you didn't mention that I – I don't know if I'm most proud of is having a, a deep background in athletics for track and field for the non for the Americans uh, and and keeping my my uh, my skin in that game continually, not to the extent that um, I once did, but because uh, I, I think that for me has been the foundation of any success that I've had was what I what I was able to learn and implement as an athletics coach. So to all those other things are icing on the cake for me. So as a sports psychologist, your area of expertise is something that I've been uh, well acquainted with in terms of working alongside some fantastic sports scientists, some fantastic strength and conditioning coaches. Um, but as I alluded to, uh, I'm fractionally out of my comfort zone here. And obviously, this being the Sports Psych Show, we're going to bring it back to sports psychology and your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences um, uh, related to sports psychology. But putting to you what you do or how you describe what you do, what I've read is that you would you would say that you're involved with athletics athletic development and that the way you go about this is functional training which in essence is building foundations in movement skills and physical literacy am i on the money there <laughs> spot on spot on you're, you're you're right on and and dealing with the uh dealing with the whole athlete which and and not trying to uh tease out and train any one component, i.e. speed, strength, uh, aerobic capacity, whatever, but put them together in the optimum blend relative to the demands of the sport and what the athlete brings to the table in terms of physical and psychological qualities to enable them to compete, uh, compete to win in the competitive arena. And, uh, you know, it's uh, to do that demands really an eclectic approach, um, looking at the whole person and and focusing on the process. So that's, you know, that's what I do. And one, one thing that you probably very few people don't know, and this is one of the reasons I was excited to be on your show, I have a pretty extensive background in sports psychology um, I got very. I had a class, believe it or not, in sports psychology in 1969 at University of California, Santa Barbara. One of the first classes ever 
taught by uh, Dr. Bill Hammer, and we had uh, our our textbook was Tutko and Ogilvy's Problem Athletes and How to Handle Them, which a lot of people have never even heard of. And Tutko and Ogilvy were pioneers in the field, and he had Tom Tutko come and talk to our class, and it was it was tremendous, and that led me to. Uh, 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 Craddy and, Va- and Vanek's book, and it was something that I incorporated. I, I knew that there was had to be another element, and that's why I said the 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 you know today there's a big talk about mindset and grit and all of that kind of stuff, which we can talk about in a few minutes. But no, it's 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 how I could how I could have you know the mind involved. I I actually when I was coaching at Cal Berkeley with my track and field athletes, I put together a little mental training handbook and it, and it, I found it here in the, in my it was called mind plus muscle equals winning and uh and uh the book that really influenced me later in the 70s was Bob Knightifer's the inner athlete and ironically in the early 80 in the 1983 I worked for Bob Knightifer for a year as he was developing the taste test the test of inner uh attentional and interpersonal style so maybe this is unfair. I've kind of ambushed you a little bit with my uh, with my background in psychology, but I, I'm interested in talking about psychology. I've had great experiences with it, and uh, not so great experiences with it. And I've seen it used sports psychology used well and uh, used as a hammer. And uh, 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 it's 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 a uh, important part of every coach's um, coaching, uh, how would you say, not toolbox, but coaching skill set to me. So sorry for the long-winded uh, uh, discourse. <laughs> no, I, 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 I love it. I don't, God, I don't know where, to, where the entrance point is there. I mean, I, I, there's so much that you've – so much rich information there. I mean, I, I just want to take you back. Uh, Ogilvy, I assume you're um, referring to – is it Bruce Ogilvy? I Bruce think Ogilvy. It was, yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm, as, I'm as much an anorak as, uh, as you are about this stuff. But um, you, you alluded to writing a, a book, Mind Plus M- Muscle, or a, a kind of a, a, a mini – book for your athletes mind plus muscle equals winning so i suppose a couple yeah. of questions around that is do you remember the basic content of that and, oh, and obviously we're going back to the would that be the early 70s around that time uh, so what kind of stuff did you write about and how was that received back then uh, it was well that in that case it was the late 70s it was 78 through eight and to 82 at yeah. university of california berkeley so you had a pretty intelligent uh, population, and um, uh, it, it related to, uh, I, I can remember it exactly, it related to goal setting and uh, step-by-step what you had to do, uh, uh, focus, uh, and, uh, and stress relief, uh, and, uh, and then uh, we, we did a fair bit on um, uh, visualization, uh, you know, in terms of visualizing their uh, their event and that, yep. and um, you know that really that really was what it was, and it was left. It was given to the athlete as a uh, uh, a resource for them to use, and and some really embraced it, and others just weren't. You know that wasn't what they needed, at, or or whatever. You know, and uh, uh, it it really started uh, before that though when I was coaching you know, 12, 13, 14-year-olds, and you could see how how kids, uh, they were kids, obviously, uh, dealt with, you know, anxiety, test anxiety, because I taught some of them in the classroom in history and then had them in, uh, you know, and that. And we realized real quickly that the kids that were real clear about what their goals and how the steps that they had to do to achieve their goals uh, handle that better, and uh, we talked. And one of the things in the mind plus muscle uh, equals winning was um, a lot of a lot of work on um, self talk, uh, and uh, um, you know, ver- and and also uh, verbalization of uh, af- of affirmations and self talk, and um, uh, and put. And one of the things in the team setting 
was put up, not put down. So that was, you know, uh, that was important. So yeah, it was a, it was only ten, twelve pages really of uh, kind of thoughts put together up to that time that I was able to call from various resources, you know. But um, but, but I think it was helpful. It was certainly helpful for me as a coach to assemble that, you know. So I'm passionate about this idea that the psych social side of sport and sports coaching drive the other areas i i I, being a sports psychologist i'm perhaps slightly biased but in, in my world what is technique without focus yeah. What what capacity do we have to execute the tech, the, 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 the tactical side of the game, um, without um, confidence or the ability to compete um, as confidently as you possibly can? And I also see the physical side being heavily mediated by the psychological side. So it, it, it sounds to me that even though you've had a life and a career on the physical side, that the, the athletic development, the conditioning, you perhaps would concur with that, that model, that notion of psychosocial driving these areas, the software driving the hardware. Absolutely. No, no, no question about it. And uh, I've always said that, uh, it, it's it's a closed loop, isn't it? You get you get mental strength from physical preparation, but your physical preparation can only be meaningful if you're fully engaged and focused on what you're doing. And uh, too many athletes, too many young athletes, uh, squander opportunities because they just do the work and they don't put the they don't. Uh, focus on the mental side they don't uh you know and that's one of the things that that i've seen that difference that champions do i champions optimize every aspect of practice that they can by by um using it to simulate competition to create uh competitive environments in practice that are going to stress them you know to, to 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 competition harden them so to speak yeah do you so in your 30 40 years of experience as a coach working with champions working with some of the leading teams do you think a lot of that psychological muscle if you like um is inbuilt or as you kind of refer to that do you think that these champions are actually working on this area or do you think it's a bit of both do you think some people really are just naturally very very good from a psychological perspective or is it all just hard work and deliberate intentional practice to improve focus and 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 and, mm-hmm. and build confidence and and deal with stress it's, a, it, it, it's both i mean look being around a, a daily thompson for example time you know over in into 84 and mm. people like that uh Michael Jordan, not, without trying to drop names and things no, no, like no. that, yep. they, they 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 didn't they didn't need a, a, at the top of their game. They didn't need a sports psychologist. They they it was intuitive. That was part of their fiber. That was part of their makeup. Um, others did, and 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 again, just like any skill set, you know, the brain is plastic, and and we can we can. Um, change behavior we can change thought processes and uh you know just having re really immersed myself in um len zykowski's book the playmaker's advantage looking at uh you know looking at the brain and looking at what we have to do to train the brain i i I, again as much as we know we haven't utilized that so it can and it has to be it has to be uh, an upfront intent as part of each, I think, as part of each practice. Yep. You know, I have a phrase that I, I just before you came on board, I'm working on, I don't know if it'll turn into a book or not, but I'm working on a serialization of it for my gain network people called The Champion's Choice. And to me, it's clear, uh, champions make choices. And what I see is a lot of the choices they make are these psychosocial types of things, you know, that how they 
how they approach practice, what kind of routine they have, how they prepare themselves mentally, you know, and that kind of stuff, you know. And it's clear. But those, you can also teach that. And I think as a coach and when you're working with younger athletes, I think um, this is this might be the most important thing that we could do rather than teaching football or teaching swimming or whatever we're doing. We should begin to help use sport. This sounds very idealistic. Use sport to help them learn how to cope, learn resilience, learn how to uh, embrace a growth mindset, which there are lessons continuing on constantly within a 45-minute training session you you have the opportunity to you know for three or four lessons in all those things every day and you but know, we, need to, we need to look for those and teach those look for teachable moments look for teachable moments absolutely and, and it, it's, it's really interesting because as you're talking there i'm reflecting back on some of my experiencing experiences working with governing bodies uh Vern, and I, I remember a good conversation I, I i i had when i was lead psychologist at england golf and i posed the question in uh, in, in one of our sort of co- conferences do we intentionally and deliberately start mental training with young players at the age of 12 13 14 even if that even if we believe at that time they don't necessarily have a inverted commas problem in that area or they haven't come across specific challenges that might be mental uh, by nature or do we wait Do we wait, do we wait, do we wait until um, they get to a stage where actually they have a specific challenge, whether it's a dip in confidence, whether it's dealing with distraction, whatever it might be. And you know what, Fern, it really split the room. It really split the room of coaches, very, very good coaches. And some coaches were going, you know, no, we've got to start this straight away. Um, Whereas other coaches said, yeah, but why why bring these? Why make this even more complicated? Uh, Why bring these additional factors in um, at 12, 13, 14 when that's not a that's not uh, an issue for them at that age or for some of them? You know, why not just wait? It's got to be individual specific. Well, I know you know where I'm going to come from with this. You teach skill and you teach mental skill. And and those are mental skills. And if you, if you look at a sport like golf, yeah. don't wait till there's a problem. Be proactive. And and this this is the this is the ongoing problem with sports psychology. In that the first book written in English was Problem Athletes and How to Handle Them in the in the nineteen sixties. And we're talking about behaviors here that are normal and hyper normal, right? Hyper we're, we're compressing a pressure situation where you're standing over a putt and you're, you're, it's not life or death, but you're, it's, it's your future right there. You sink that putt and you're on the Ryder Cup team. And what does that do for the rest of your life, right? So why wait until you, in quote, I, I abhor the term choking just like I abhor the term mental toughness. But why wait until you don't, have the appropriate skills to deal with the pressure of the situation. So you can, and and this is the thing, the problem, the other problem here is, is that we've tended, and this is what the mistake I made at Cal and at other places, is we tended to separate the mental training from the physical training. We'd sit in a room and talk or visualize or do contract, you know, uh, progressive relaxation instead of doing it in the sport venue as part of practice. And this is what I saw Harry Mara with um, Ashton Eaton and, and, uh, and, and his wife. It was all, I, I watched a lot of, several sessions with them, and it was as much mental as it was physical. But it was all transparent and part of the training session. You know, and uh, uh, I, I, there's a really good sports psychologist, Christina Fink, that, works with the um, Philadelphia Union and Philadelphia Union Academy and uh, 
she was an all-american high jumper and olympian from mexico and i knew her when i did some work down in mexico and and i had her uh my 1500 meter runner go see her and they sat and talked and then she said the most important thing i can do peter is to come out and watch you race and just watched watched him race and then they they just walked around during his cool down and talked about what his thought process was and gave him some some and and peter alludes to that you know has alluded to that that was a couple of years ago several different times about how valuable that was you know so uh anyway no it's, it's that's we have to we still have this mind body dichotomy we've got to get rid of this divide and um and recognize that it's 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 unity it's Everything works together. So. It, it's really interesting this sort of socio-historical context you talked about. The first that first textbook you read back in 1969, a problem athlete and how to deal with it, or whatever the title was, and a problem that word problem. You know, it keeps coming up. Psychology has a burden. Sports psychology has a burden of definition because yep. it comes burdened with that notion of well it's for it's for players it's for athletes it's for competitors with a problem and you know for me that leads to the next challenge which is it leads to isolation the, the isolation of sports psychology or, or the psych social piece you know it's yeah. historically um I, i've gone into say soccer clubs and it's been you know dance over there for you if 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 you need him if you need him if he's got if you've got a problem and so it's isolated and i i for me i'm i'm very much trying to sell in this notion of integration now absolutely from if it's clinical psychology if it's serious depression if it's eating That's disorders different. that is that is absolutely a case for isolation and then above that see i i separate psychology and sport into three areas you've got the performance psychology piece which is above the surface level you've got the well-being piece which is at the surface level and then you've got the clinical psychology piece which is below the surface so that's isolated well-being uh, encompasses a bit of both but then the performance psychology piece has to be out in the open it has to be integrated a lot of that happening through coaches alongside the sports psychologist and as you say on the pitch or the court or the course now i think just the, the other challenge we've got there, Vern, is that we've then got the how-to piece. Well, how, you know, for me, I've got a lot of grassroots coaches and, and where I've tried to take my career as a sports psychologist is demystifying sports psychology because there's a lot of grass, uh, grassroots coaches, volunteers um, who will say, OK, well, I hear you guys, I hear you, Vern, and I hear you, Dan, talking, talking about integration, but hey, you know, I've got I'm grassroots. I've got an hour and a half with my players a couple of times a week. How do I do that? So I think the challenge we've got is helping upskilling coaches to have applicable tools and techniques and frameworks and philosophies that not just relate to the tech tac piece, but also the psych piece as well. Agree a hundred percent. And in your in your training plan, uh, you just you, you know you address that. I mean, I. If we're going to do uh, uh, small-sided games, you know, with a goalkeeper, well, then, you know, assuming you have a goalkeeper coach, then the goalkeeper coach is is talking to the athlete about certain, you know, certain situational awareness. Uh, there should be. Uh, it's not just physical facts of passing the ball. It's it's understanding how you open your vision, which is how you pay attention, right? And and so, again, you don't have to call it psych. psych. It's, it's, it's just in total integration. And uh, it, to me, uh, the great coaches that I've been able to be around, this is what they do. They're, they're great sports psychologists because they understand the applied side. Uh, you know, and, and, and you see some people that are labeled great coaches – that achieve that through manipulation, domination, and control, and that's that's the dark side of this, isn't it? You know, like uh, it was really interesting watching this thing on um, Apple TV about Man City, and uh, and how uh, Kevin De Bruyne was. I'd forgotten that he'd been at Chelsea, 
And basically, the great one, Mourinho, almost destroyed him. You know, uh, and, and he does. He destroy. I'm sorry, I don't know the man. I've tried to read and understand everything. But um, I think watching behind the scenes, watching Pep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola is a master psychologist. He's, he's a master teacher. And he knows when to put the hammer down, and he knows when to hug a, kid, uh, a player, you know, and uh, you know, and that. Where the other guy's method is, manip- I call it manipulation, domination, and control, you know, which is, uh, you know, and so it can be a positive tool, it can be a negative tool. I think one thing that I found as I got a little bit overboard with sports psych sometimes in terms of um, I think we got in the, in the early and mid 80s uh, and with my decathletes too we probably got a little too uh, introspective a little too much into thinking and not enough and, and not enough doing and uh, not enough of this uh, actual blending, you know, on the field, on the pitch, on the track, and that kind of stuff, you know. And um, that's where um, myself as a sport coach, as a athletic development coach, I want to work with somebody uh, like you, like uh, Christina Fink, or somebody like that that's going to help me develop my skill sets uh, continuing constantly. And, and I know when I was director of conditioning with the White Sox and I brought the whole sports psych piece, part of my, I, I was basically in essence a performance director before they called it performance director and brought sports psych in. We used the test of attentional personal style mm-hmm. uh, with the players. We used it with the coaches and they were scared spitless. The coaches were scared spitless. And I said, look, it, we're not we're not going to go in and work with the players. That's not sports. We're going to help you be a better coach. So we're going to let, we're going to find out how you pay attention, how you work under pressure, how you can communicate better under pressure so that you can help the player do better under pressure, you know, and that, and it was after the initial wariness, it was really embraced. And, um, you know, you had varying degrees of educational background and sport, grizzled old baseball players in their 50s that, you know, played pro ball. And, and they go, gosh, you know, this really makes a lot of sense. So we used we use it to improve. We use sports psych really to improve the quality of coaching and the ability to communicate better with the athletes and establish uh, healthy relationships to help the athletes cope with, because minor league baseball is is really tough because they're trying desperately, you know, to make it to make the big leagues and that you know and pressure is every every at bat is a pressure situation you know so so that was an example I think of how we were able to use it in a positive manner. Just going back, so I, I, I want to uh, focus in on that baseball uh, scenario, but just going back to Pep Guardiola versus Mourinho, I mean, I just think that Guardiola, I, I always, something I always say to coaches is when you coach, um, no matter what sport, no matter what activity you're coaching, you have two dials. You have a stretch dial and you have a support dial. And I think mm-hmm. the best coaches, to, to, to simplify a complex um, scenario um, the best coaches are the ones who can get that balance of stretch and support who at times might turn up the volume of stretch and turn up the volume of support or even turn down the volume of support when the, when the volume yeah. of stretch is high to, to help players act more autonomously to, to, to help them self-regulate better and vice versa and I think Guardiola from what I've seen and I haven't met Guardiola I haven't been inside Manchester City camp but um, from talking with people in there, he's a he's brilliant at getting that right. Um, coming to the, the uh, utilising um, the test of attention and interpersonal style, and for any listeners, that's uh, Robert, the work of uh, Robert Nidifer, isn't it? And um, 
it, it's very much Nidifer talks about focus of attention in I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get this right I'm going into the back of my mind with the uh, with the uh, uh, information here but uh, internal versus external um, focus of attention wide and narrow wide versus right. narrow right. and um, so with baseball working with seasoned baseball players were you helping them shift their focus of attention uh, to optimize their performance were you talking to them about the advantage of having an external focus versus internal a wide versus narrow was that how you were using uh Nidifer's work on it, attention yeah the wide versus narrow is more gabriella wolf than it yes. than it was i okay. think yep but bob's was uh what happens under, you know, how you react and how you're focused, how you pay attention under pressure. Okay. And and then you narrow, if some people narrow, some people need social support, some people need isolation. And so what we tried to do was make the players aware of their attentional style and then and the manager aware of their attentional style and how the two would match up to facilitate uh, optimum communication and teaching in various types of situations, okay? And so I know that under pressure, that as a, I, I, I've took, taken the test several times and Bob's given me feedback, that initially I need to be by myself for a minute. Well, if I'm coaching the team and I walk away from the team and they don't know that, they're going to go, geez, that, you know, that bugger's just abandoning me. Where I know I need to get control of my emotions, control of my thoughts, and then walk back and then be a rock for them, you know. So, no, it was, it was used to facilitate uh, a greater awareness within the player and give them the tools to be able to um, uh, use their mental skills, their you know, compete to their strengths, I guess, is really the best. And, you know, and and again, there's a lot of other instruments. I'm not big on psychometrics. I just happened to have been exposed to that early. And it was simple. There was a short version of the test <coughs> in, in regard to baseball and also in football. It was in English and in Spanish. Um, you know, so in, in at least in, in football, soccer in North America and Central America, the, the, you know, the bilingual aspect is uh, English and Spanish is pretty important and the same thing in baseball, you know, so that was, that was why. You, you know, know so. what, what, what I love about what you've just said is you've kind of alluded to the notion that by working uh, as a coach, working on my own mindset or understanding, in this case, your attentional style, um, it had a positive knock-on effect with your relationship with the players you were coaching by you knowing you better you were able to communicate with the players hey look when you see me do this i'm just focusing my attention this isn't i'm not snubbing you i'm not this behavior isn't something that's that, that that's unhelpful it's something that's helpful for me so just bear that in mind so it's working it's something i found in my work is by helping individuals become more self-aware by helping them improve their um, capacity to think about their thinking their their their, their meta ability if you like um, that helps them become better teammates in essence well and, and and here's the thing if I were king for a day or I were a performance director or uh, <coughs> head coach uh, if, say I mean I, I, the only place I'd probably be a head coach would be an athletics coach or something I would find uh, a sports psychologist that would be not my shrink, but that would be my shadow. They would be my shadow. They would be in on all the planning meetings. They would be. They would give me uh, direct daily debriefs of my interaction with the team, with the staff. If I can be, it sounds like I'm making it very uh, I and me kind of centric, but and and that would actually their responsibility would be the coaching staff, okay? Because the coaching staff is the constant. The players change, and if I can improve the quality of the coaching staff relative to the players, just think how much better you can be. 
you're you're not talking marginal gains. You're talking quantum leaps here. You know, communication within the coaching staff. Okay, communication with the back room staff. You know, uh, all of this kind of stuff. That's where this can be incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable. But we're not exploring the the uh, the resources that we have available today. Nor the, this this was what hit me reading the Playmakers Advantage and interviewing face to face and spending about three hours with Len Zykowski. Mm. Len's a little bit, I think he's a year or two older than I, so we're both 50-plus years in this, you know, in this crazy world of sport. And we real, looking back, we realize the tools that are out there now that are just not being used, you know, that uh, in this whole realm, uh, that it's, it's depressing and exciting. <laughs> but, 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 but Vern, what you're just saying there, again, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited by what you're saying because... <laughs> It, it's it's my day to day experience. This I'm so passionate about coaches putting psychosocial first and and being passionate about psychosocial and understanding what psychosocial is because often they think of psychosocial and they just think of whether it's communication or as, as we've alluded to earlier players having a problem but it's really not and I'll give you an, an example from my own playbook I mean I have this um, psychological interve- intervention called a game face which is in essence the personality you want to be on the pitch it's who you, it's how you're going to react and respond respond in moments of adversity it's it it's almost like the the individual zone of optimal functioning if i was to use a psychological term and where i get really excited is in my consultancy when i'm working with a team or a club an organization and i'm working with a few players and we 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 co-create a game face when the coaches are engaged and interested and they can reinforce that game face in training, in practice, when they can ask a player to um, uh, 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 to be their game face and show them their game face when they're doing a small-sided game or a keep ball, and then when they get into the changing room, the dressing room before a game, and they're reinforcing, come on, in this match today, for you to give yourself the best chance to have an 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10 performance, you've got to have a 10 out of 10 mindset or as close yeah. to 10 out of 10 as you can have. That means I want to see your game face. If you miss a great chance, come back to your game face. If we give a goal away, come back to your game face. You know, if you go a set down, come back to your game face. If you make a few bogeys in a row, your game face, your routine. So when coaches yeah. are passionate about this, Vern, that, that integration is just... It's so powerful and that, that what breaks my heart is there's so many coaches out there who are good anyway but that that without having that psych social at the forefront of their mind they prevent themselves from going to great it's where that classic jim collins line of good getting in the way of great yep yep no 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 question and it's it's right there in front of us it's right there for us to use without additional effort and uh again it's use collins that's what separates the good from the great I, 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 I think when you spend uh, uh, a bit of time around great coaches in individual sports or team sports, you, you recognize that they, they're dealing with the total individual. You know, they're, they're, they're looking at uh, how they can, so, you know, do all of that. So uh, one thing you mentioned that, uh, uh, in your email when you contacted me about being on too was um, – and this has really come it was this whole issue of mental toughness, and uh, this has really come to the fore, <clears throat> as you know, in the states now with this issue. At, there's been a big thing with the University of Maryland football, where a player was killed. Uh, basically, uh, I, I notice I said killed, didn't die. He was killed during a uh, basically a mental toughness type of workout. And that, and I've been pretty outspoken, and I think maybe that's what attracted you to have me on in my criticism of of um, mental toughness. I, I I don't I abhor the term. I, I think it has a lot of negative connotations, and uh, uh, I know what people are alluding to that the champions have this. Uh, Doc Councilman, the famous swim coach from Indiana, called it the X factor. Uh, but it's 
I, I call it resilience, mental strength. There's a lot of, I, I don't like the term grit. I think we've overused. It's become, um, uh, I, I use it, but I don't use it to the extent that other people do anymore. But, um, you know, and uh, maybe I'm not being very articulate here, but we can, again, it's another one of those things where we look for opportunities within training sessions where the athlete can push themselves beyond what sh- at, at a level of which they're capable. It can be just that one extra step. And I think we need to, as coaches, look for opportunities, again, those teachable moments yep. to reinforce mental strength where you really, yeah, you, 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 you made that great pass in the last minute of practice that two weeks ago you couldn't do, you know, and that. So I don't know. I just wish that, in, you know, as at age 71, I hope I'm around for a while, and I'd love to see mental toughness stricken from coaches' vocabulary, you know. And uh, I, I, I get it that, you know, the Navy SEALs and the uh, whatever your equivalent and, you know, those guys are, um, but, you know, it's not screaming and hollering. It's, yeah. it, I, I think the people that I've seen that, you know, that, are, quote, are the most mentally tough, are, they're like steel. They're, they're, so, they're so focused. They're so, they're so dialed in. And it doesn't just happen in, in games. It happens in practice. But they're not doing stupid things to achieve this quality you know they're 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 and 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 maybe this is another way of putting it look the difference is i use michael jordan as an example if you're what you're walking along a sidewalk and you're talking into practice okay and we're walking and i'm ahead of him he's going to catch up to me and then he's going to try to walk faster and i'll walk faster and I watched him in practice. He made everybody, including the coaches in practice, uncomfortable by his drive and determination every day. And the thing that I observed about champions is they're comfortable with being uncomfortable all the time. And they make everybody around them uncomfortable, you know, with their drive and determination. Now, sometimes that's pathological, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, but But we know when... It's easy to recognize when that goes over the line. So sorry for my rant, but I wanted to make sure before we ended that I got that got that in. And, and uh, you know, it's a perspective. Uh, I understand. It's a bias on my part. But having played American football in the 60s where everything was macho, which it still is today, mental toughness, it's a tough game. I understand that. But... Um, uh, again, it's 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 more about mental strength and resilience than it is about uh, some uh, MMA fighter or something like that, some external kind of thing. So but, uh, I'm in agreement with you, and and maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, I, I, I it's not so much I wouldn't have been in agreement with you. I, I I just would have naturally used the term mental toughness, and it's I think it's a really interesting topic and debate at the moment i think somebody was saying to me there's roughly 45 journal articles out there that give different um um, definitions of mental toughness it's Uh clearly a term that 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 not only courts controversy but it's also very difficult to pin down and define and 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 maybe that's always going to be the case on the psychological side but i i I actually use the term mental skill more than anything else because as you said earlier it's skill it really is you know really interesting but i mean yesterday i had a a golfer text text message me uh, after his fourth round of a european tour event and he said you know i was so proud to get to the the the, the end of today and get the most out of my round and it, it, it was a real grind out there now we've only just started working together we're a couple of months into our relationship and what i what i put to him after congratulating him and and for using starting to use the tools and the techniques that we've been talking about and the philosophies is that what will be interesting is to start replacing the word grind for mental skill 
Because at the moment, I, his inner story is that was a grind, that was hard, that was tough. And it's like, actually, maybe, maybe you were just utilizing mental skill here. You were shifting your focus of attention away from whether it's uh, negative thoughts after a few bad shots. You were working hard to remind yourself that, hey, I'm on my C game here, but my job is to get the most for my C game. You were shifting your attention away from the bad bounces and the weather and, and where you were in the field because you can't control that, all the things that we've spoken about. And that is just skill. And it really doesn't matter. And, and, and you alluded to MMA there, whether it's rugby or American football or, or, or uh, 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 MMA boxing, Boxing, the kind of sports that are physical in nature are combative. I think as coaches, we're so socialized into, you know, it's physical, it's aggressive, it's violence. And hang on, stop. Actually, actually, they're games of skill, not just movement wise and, 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 um, and, and having a physical literacy, but it's, it's a game of skill from a mental perspective. Yeah. For you to be able to optimize your training in that moment, you know, whether it's in the ring or the octagon or, or on the pitch in rugby and, and the gridiron, uh, it really is. It, it, you've got to have mental skill. You've got to have that adaptability in the moment. So I think whether you say mental skill leading to mental strength or you say uh, mental skill leading to, um, high, I use the term high performance mindset. But mental skill, I think, is a, is a useful term. It's the term I use. But then I also come back to, I always like to talk about, to talk with, with um, clients, athletes. What does your own personal 10 out of 10 look like and feel mm -hmm. like? And what yeah. are your personal, it's like, I'm going to come back to you here because you've written here, I, I abhor the term mental toughness and all the implication, uh, implications and baggage that comes with it. It's not part of my coaching vocabulary or practice. I want to help my athletes be mentally strong and understand why they are doing what they are doing. Um, and I think that's so important. Uh, again, we're talking about the self-awareness piece here. Why do I do what I do? What does 10-10 look like, feel like? What do others see? What drops me down to 8, to 7, to 6? And I think combined with that, I, a few weeks ago, I think you retweeted something uh, on uh, something I, I wrote on vulnerability. And I think what you're kind of saying as well is when we use this term mental toughness, we almost stop permit, stop giving ourselves permission to be vulnerable when anxieties and worries and doubts are part of what's being human. And I don't think you can have mental skill and mental strength without saying, look, there are times when I come down to six or seven or five out of ten, whatever that looks like for me, I will have anxieties and doubts and worries. And that's OK. Here are the skills I've got in place to be able to deal with that. And I think toughness doesn't get to just, as you say, with grit as well. There's an element of it. It, 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 it It's not it, it's not human enough. It's not you've got to be right. gritty all the time. You've got to be tough all the time. No. To no. be tough, you've got to accept that you're a human being. That, that's kind of how I see it, Van. No, I agree, and 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 understand that that there's ups and downs, and uh, and you learn from you learn from the uh, from the wins, and you learn from the losses, and that's that's the role we have to play as uh, you know as coaches, as sports psychologists, and that. So, no, that's good. Look, good. good. Look, before before we finish, there's one there's one one really important question I want to ask, and, and just getting a bit more specific here. Um, so you've done so much in athletics, and I, I think this is a really interesting thing. Whereby, if you take a sport like soccer, where there's a great deal of complexity there, um, there's a billion different options going on at any given time. If you take a sport like golf, where there's lots of time to think, and I know when I was a pro golfer, I'd be thinking a lot of the bad stuff. Um, Athletics, I, I find it an interesting one. I, I suppose I can see where the psychology uh, plays a, a, a big role there. But the, the simpler the sports, maybe the less psychological it is. What's your thoughts? And I'm not saying that's my opinion. I'm just interested. What, what makes 100 metres psychological? What makes a 10,000 metres psychological? Uh, I I wouldn't agree that the simpler the sport. I mean, the hundred meters is a psychological pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. I mean, one 
one mental mistake, uh, you lose concentration for a hundredth of a second and the race is over. You know, so you've got to learn. That's the that and and uh, the the consummate teacher in that regard was a guy named Bud Winner, who was the coach of all the great sprinters, Tommy Smith, Lee Evans, uh, in, in, in the, well, he coached the world record holder in the 1940s, but into the 60s, and, and, and his, his classic book is Relax to Win, and he learned in training pilots during World War II that relaxation was the key in those pressure cooker situations. In a in a ten thousand meters, it's it's a different uh, it's a different pressure cooker. It's it's a uh, uh, you know you if you lose concentration, there's a chance to gain it back depending on the race. There's a chance. Now in the Olympic Games at the you know Diamond League level, it probably isn't going to happen. At the developmental level, it is so. It's understanding again, going back to shifting focus to wide and narrow, you know. In the in the, you know, and and I know this is what we're dealing with with our fifteen hundred meter runner we're working with is to get him to um, to embrace running in the pack rather than fear running in the pack, you know. And that so really simple. I mean, it's real simple. Hundred meters is real simple superficially. Don't start thinking about it. <laughs> right, right. I, I, I love you. I love what you've said there about the ten thousand meters. You're almost changing that in a narrative. I find a lot of my work is about changing the meaning of given situations. So, whereas this athlete sounds to me like the meaning of the pack could be related to crowded, tense, tight, conscious of other people, I assume you're trying to shift the meaning towards something else in essence something more adaptive something more more positive yeah, in yeah. simple terms when do i focus in you know and shifting focus when do i focus in and on you know my you know my breathing my stride and then when do i look at where i am in regard to uh the pack or when you know where is it uh am i at three thousand meters am i at eight thousand meters you know and all of these things that have to go into the computer where you have <clears throat> 27, 28 plus minutes where in the 100 you basically have almost zero zilch processing time. You know, it's very much like the goalkeeper has an, having to react to that, you know, that ball coming into the penalty area and I've got boom, 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 and that's over. You know, it's over. And, uh, so it, the, the devil is in the details of preparation, I think, in that regard. And, and so my last question, just going back to the baseball piece, in your experience having worked at the highest of highest levels, uh, it's a generic question, so coming back to the wide, the narrow, the internal, the external focus, in your experience as a baseball player, best off and I could replace this for cricket in England or other countries is a baseball player best off focusing on the ball is a baseball player best off having a a, a thought or a feeling or is it in when I say thought or feeling it could be a thought or a feeling on an emotion it could be a thought or a feeling related to a technique um, or is it very individual specific what have you found you're talking about the batsman or the, the batter. sorry the, the, yeah. Yeah, the batsman yeah yeah well there's <laughs> As you know, there's a myriad of research and a myriad of practice. And uh, you know that a pitcher uh, delivering a pitch that you're only going to see the ball, what, the first three, two meters, something like that. So to me, it's focusing on broad, you know, broad, narrow to broad, uh, focusing on uh, on controlling my, um, you know, balance and, 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 and uh, what can I can I pick up? And the same thing, looking at the bowler, can I pick up cues from the body of the bowler or the pitcher that will enable me to um, narrow my selection, so to speak? You know, and <clears throat> I think that it's interesting that you asked this as a last question because in American baseball right now, hitting 
has is an absolute nadir. It's absolutely the worst it's ever been historically. Okay. And uh, I that's another topic for another podcast. And uh, I have a lot of opinions, and I don't think we've done a good job of um, uh, of understanding what we know as skill acquisition uh, and and recognition. And uh, it's not vision. It's not the physical act of, of vision. It's the it's the um, processing of what we see. So, in in my opinion, I'll summarize: is I think this is an area where there's a tremendous amount of possibilities for growth if we could get everybody in one room um, uh, from cricket and softball and baseball mm. and uh, throw out. Uh, immediately throw out all the old Miss and, uh, the, the, you know, and I think cricket is doing a better job of recognizing uh, pitches and hitting, you know, than, than baseball is. And I think, uh, I know we did some stuff that was secret with, uh, I didn't even know because I was an American with Australian softball in terms of pitch recognition that enable the Aussie women to hit better than anybody else. So it's there, it's there, but we're not using it. Fantastic, brilliant. And what's interesting to me, just to round this up, is we've talked for fifty minutes, but we've we've talked about so many different topics. You know, stretch and support, and and attentional style, and stress relief, and and choice. And there's so many things there. And that, that's what I want from this podcast is to really make things accessible and scaffold things down. And even with the athletics, it's 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 great to know and and to help people understand that even 100 meters this is very psychological and i can lose my attention for a hundredth hundredth of a second and hey i might be dead in that race or i am dead in that race and we're dealing with a a long distance runner who has to has to have more mental skill um when he's running in the pack so that's what so many people don't recognize these things and so thank you so much for joining me and uh, we'll do this again soon very good thank you i appreciate it Thank you for having me on. Thank you very much. That was Vern Gambetta. I really enjoyed that chat. It was great to talk to somebody who's worked in sports psychology since the 1960s, who's worked with elite athletes using sports psychology interventions through the 70s and 80s and 90s. And to listen to some of those stories revolving around elite athletes was absolutely fascinating. If you enjoyed that chat just as much as I did, please do leave a review. And remember, you can subscribe to the Sports Site Show for future updates. I hope you'll be able to tune in next time. Bye for now.